And it's my pleasure today to introduce our uh, keynote speaker, also our concluded, uh, concluding keynote speaker for our workshop uh, now. Um, today, we are so um, honored to have invited Professor Diana Laureate um, from UCL to join us as the keynote. And please, um, in the following you know, several minutes, please let me introduce um, Professor Diana Laureate. Um, um, professor Lorela is a professor in uh, of learning with digital technology at UCL Knowledge Lab, uh, University College London. And Professor Lorela is very well known in uh, in the uh, research area of um, technology and education and learning design. And she has made a lot of achievements over the years. Below are just a, a few of them. She has developed the projects in two long-running uh, ESRC centers. And those projects aim at investigating the potential of co-designed massive open online collaborations, so-called co moves to address the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals through large-scale professional development courses. One impact has been to reach a total of over 50,000 teachers as active learners in over 100 countries. And particularly, um, for such courses, 40% um, of the participants were from low and middle income countries. Also, uh, Professor Lorena developed the Learning Designer in an ESRC funded project which is the free open online design tool to support teachers in all sectors moving to blended and online teaching. Now supported as a UCL wide tool, the website has had 200,000 unique visits over the last year. As the head of the e-learning strategy unit, Department for Education and Skills, Professor Lorna de developed the country's first cross-sector strategy, harnessing technology, transforming learning and children's services, following a nationwide consultation that involved over 15,000 educators. As provides vice learning technologies and teaching at Open University, the first position of its kind in UK, Professor Lorna developed the country's first strategy for advancing learning and, uh, learning and teaching technology, which changed the way courses were developed and delivered for 200,000 students. It was embedded in several of the department policies. So from the, the above uh, introduction, I'm deeply moved because the impact is not limited only in academia. It has actually made a difference in the world. I think this is much respected. And uh, as a researcher and educator, this is what we should commit to. So with a lot of respect, please join me. Welcome, Professor Lorna. That's a very kind introduction. I do appreciate it. And also the invitation to come to this fascinating conference that we've had this week. I was very fortunate that it coincided with a trip I was doing to Hong Kong um, to give a talk tomorrow. Um, and especially delighted because I've known Professor Nancy Law for several decades, I think, Nancy, actually. And talking with her is always for me like a meeting of minds. And it has meant so much to have this constant person um, in my academic life and we share the same ideas and the same approaches to what we're all trying to do in education. So um, the way you characterized it, Professor Jones, is, is lovely. Thank you very much. Um, and it's Nancy I have to thank for the title of this. Is it possible to develop... Come on, I'm supposed to... Oh, no, I'm doing, doing it. I'm doing that. It's not doing it, I'm doing it. Okay. Is it possible to develop a parsimonious approach to design the world learning analytics. It's, it's a curious title. The word parsimonious doesn't appear in any academic title I know of except one of Nancy's <laughs> own papers. So it was interesting to think about this as a problem because we now have this extraordinary challenge put to us by the world of AI. 
about what AI can now contribute to what we're trying to do in learning design. And of course, learning analytics have been around for quite a while, but they've not been integrated with learning design. So it's a very good challenge to put to us. Is it possible to create this kind of approach that brings these two areas together? So my outline is going to be how, first of all, do we define the learning design um, for teachers to use? If we're going to end up with being able to say something about hey, how AI technologies can help us with learning, learning analytics, we have to build up to that from a base where we're understanding what we mean by learning design. And I'm going to talk about that in terms of what it takes to learn a tool, which is what learning design is all about. And then asking how can technologies help and then checking the extent to which this is a parsimonious account of the kind that um, Nancy envisages. And I'm going to explain what I think we mean by a parsimonious account. Then we have to think through, so what are the key features of a, of a learning design itself anyway, which are supposed to contribute to what it takes to learn? And then what is a good learning design? Because we want learning analytics to tell us something about what we're designing. We better know what we mean by a good learning design. And after all that, we come around to say, so what would those learning analytics be? So that's, that's roughly the direction of the argument. And I begin with what it takes to learn because that is fundamental to what every teacher is trying to do, is trying to understand what it takes for their students to achieve the kinds of learning outcomes we need for them. And to help us with that, some years ago, I developed the idea of the conversational framework, which as this explains, derives from theories and research studies on education and how students learn more or less over the last century. And the book I wrote about that um, called Rethinking University Teaching some decades ago, um, and then another book on teaching as a design science uses this kind of framework to try and understand what we mean by the teaching learning process. So it's, as that diagram is illustrating, it's Essentially, it's seeing it as a series of iterative exchanges between learner and the teacher and between the learner and their peers and at those two levels of concepts and practices. And it will work in, in any context because all of those original studies were done in a variety of different educational contexts. So this is how we build it up. Um, we've got the teacher on one side represented in terms of their concepts and practices. The learner in general in the middle and that learner is interacting with their peers. So their peers are represented on the right by this other pair. And the way that learning works is that the teacher is, is trying to enable their students to understand the concepts, which means that their concepts have to change a bit. And these red arrows signify the learner is doing something. And that's what learning acquisition looks like. So what we're doing now, when I'm presenting to you and you're trying to follow what I'm saying, is learning through acquisition. You're not doing anything other than trying to make sense of what I'm saying. But when we come to something like learning through inquiry, the learner itself, themselves, are generating something to do. And you might go to the teacher and ask questions. You might go to the library and read books. You might go to the internet with some question that you want to answer. But it's the learner being active there. So those red arrows mean that in learning through inquiry, you're going, you're deciding to go to the teacher with a question and you get something back, maybe just a book, whatever it is. And that's what helps to change and develop your concept. Then for learning through practice, it's more complicated because now the learner has been set some goal by the learning environment. And this might be something quite simple, just like having a discussion in class, and that's your learning environment. Or it might be an experiment in a, in a, a wet lab of some kind. But in any case, the, the task is set. The learner tries to develop some practice which acts on the learning environment, and they'll get some feedback. And they could just carry on going around that loop to try and get their practice improved. But they will also probably have to engage with their concepts, and that's why that vertical cycle is going through there as well. And use their conceptual understanding then to drive and improve their practice in that learning environment. So learning through practice is a much more complex process 
from learning through inquiry. And then from learning through discussion, you are, as a learner, you're generating ideas for other people to listen to, or you're responding to what they're saying. Equally, your peer is responding to you, or challenging you, or asking you questions. And that dialogue is also driving that conceptual change. But there's no practice going on here. This is all words, essentially. It might be text, or it might be chat, but it's essentially words. And then learning through collaboration is more complex yet, because the learners are exchanging their practices, which they've already been developing, but they're also exchanging ideas and um, trying to develop those, and ultimately to then produce something for the teacher. So in order to, I just go back a bit on that, and show learning through production separately as where you're joining your concepts and practices together to produce an assignment or an essay or an exam paper or something like that for the teacher. So learning through production is essentially what we're doing in assessment, whether it's formative or summative, or if the teacher assigns any kind of assignment to the student, where the student now has to express their own idea about what they know. So there's the complete conversational framework. And the point really is for all of us to try and engage those cycles of learning, both conceptual learning and practice learning, and the relationship between the two. That's what it, we're, we're all after. So there's a sense in which that's what it takes to learn. We've got to try and help them do that. Okay, so in conventional technologies for learning through acquisition, we have presentations, reading, for inquiry, we send students to the library or give them papers to read. For practice, you can have labs or exercises or quizzes. For learning through discussion, um, you set up discussion groups, small group discussion groups. For collaborating, you give them group projects. For producing, you give them essays or reports to write and so on. So our conventional teaching methods, teaching and learning methods, are all mapped onto the conversational framework. Now, with digital methods, of course, we have masses more things we can do. Um, we can use di digital images, uh, videos, podcasts, all kinds of things which are different from lectures or the learning through acquisition. For learning through inquiry, of course, exploring the internet is ideal for students. Um, <clears throat> for learning through practice, using a digital model of something or using a quiz where they get immediate feedback are very good ways of of practicing your ideas and, and, and understanding. For learning through discussion, we often use text chat or WhatsApp groups, discussion groups, online forums, use Menti for a whole class where everybody has to put their own question or their own um, answer to the teacher's question into Menti. For collaborating, you might get your students to draft a wiki. You probably wouldn't necessarily publish it on Wikipedia, but at least they could go through the practice of trying to develop a way of representing a particular subject. And for producing, well, why not get them to make a website? I mean, that's quite challenging in itself, but you've really got to do the work to express what you know in order to do such a thing. So um, those are just a very small selection of all the many, many different types of digital tools and methods we could be using. Again, map to the conversational framework and offering quite different types of learning for students to do. And we really want to try and embrace as many of those as we can to get those cycles of development moving. All right, now, how do we use um, digital technologies to help improve learning? Well, um, go through those six types. Let's see what sorts of things we can do. And I think it's going to be a bit difficult for me to manipulate. Um, So this is the way in which oh, it's very hard to control. Can you just yeah move it to about there? Yeah, that's right. That's okay. So if you're trying to explain the idea in physics of the water cycle, of how water moves around through the environment. Um, and I got this from NASA, so it looks actually rather terrifying, the whole thing, the way they've, they've done it. But you can see how you've got um, 
the, the water was evaporating from the land, it creates clouds, which then create rain, which then soaks through the land and the water flows back into the sea. So it's it's a beautifully straightforward image, which then students can carry on their head. Um, and uh, so any kind of video of that kind can be extremely helpful for conceptual understanding. And we've got masses more opportunities like this to help with um, learning through acquisition. Learning through query, well, I found that just by um, looking on the web for illustrations of the water cycle, and there's hundreds of them. So you can get your students to go and look at alternative forms of representation, and sometimes different perspectives on. So another one I tried was looking through representations of Marxism. And again, there's hundreds of different kinds of ways in which people are telling students, teaching students about the theories of, of Marxism. But it's always important, if you're going to assist their understanding, to enable them to embed that exploration within, um, giving them agency of discovery, but also the means by which they evaluate what they're getting. Because as we're all aware, the internet is full of falsehoods as well. So learning through inquiry is something where you send the student off to something much worse than a library, because a library will be properly curated. The internet isn't. So you might say, only look at these websites, but your students will go and explore others anyway. So it's very important that learning through inquiry is embedded in that attention to evaluation of what you find. I don't think you need to do anything with all of you. I'm not doing any more videos. <laughs> okay, so learning through discussion, I mentioned Menti, and this is a, a nice way in um, one of our courses, I think this is the one for teachers. Um, one of the problems with using learning design to plan your course, and we were able to involve a very large number of teachers in responding to that question because it's all anonymous, it's online, every individual can do it. If you have that kind of discussion in a Q&A session in a conference or something, maybe three people have an interaction with you, maybe 10, it's not many more than that. But with this, hundreds can. So I collect all these and then look at them after the, the conference and sometimes respond to them and send them back. And that's what I'm going to do with um, one of our this morning, for example, when I was collecting students' um, questions. So that's very good for enabling every single student to take part in a class discussion, because otherwise, most students will leave it to the three who always ask questions, and they don't really participate, so it's not as much help. Learning through practice, this is an example from an engineering course, um, uh, a, a design generation tool, which uh, students can play with to try and work something out what they're going to design before they go to the lab. So it's a, a, a nice way of trying to do that. And what you get with practice of this kind, when it's a digital tool, is you get immediately meaningful feedback. And I think this one represents that even better. This is from the University of Colorado, which is showing you how um, energy forms of different kinds and different amounts can change the water temperatures. Now you can just play with that and see what happens if you change parameters. But the more challenging task is to say, can you raise the water level to a particular temperature? And then you've got to really work out what those relationships are between the different parameters. You've really got to think about it. And you don't need to, anybody to tell you whether you've got the answer right or wrong. So if you've only raised the temperature to 20 degrees and it's supposed to be 80 degrees, you, you've got to go back and figure out what to do to get to the right answer. So models of that kind are really challenging opportunities for students self-directed learning. They're very helpful. Learning through collaboration. Um, this is one where, uh, this is one. Oh yes, this, this was one from uh, a TPD course, a teacher professional development course, where we were asking teachers to share what kinds of digital tools they use with their students and how they use them. So it's a very nice way of getting people to show what they've found, but also comment on what other people have found. Because on Padlet, you can go into each of these and make points or ask questions, generate discussion. Or you could use that Padlet 
as the basis for a forum discussion about that particular part of, of your teaching. So again, learning through collaboration has many, many different ways we can support that kind of sharing and commenting among students and um, professionals. And finally, in learning through production, well, teachers, of course, have many ways of presenting to students now, not just PowerPoint, there's all sorts of other things. But everything that a teacher uses, students can use as well. So I quite like this example from a teacher in the secondary school. Um, I think this was a religious studies course, and she wanted students to understand the form and features of sacred buildings. So she got them to design their own PowerPoint illustration of a building of their own design. And that meant they had to go and do a lot of research. So they're motivated to do that research so that they get a good and accurate representation of their own creative learning design, uh, sorry, architectural design of a sacred building. So again, that's the kind of pedagogy that is not confined to religious education. You could do this for absolutely anything, get students to generate their own PowerPoint presentation with animation of an idea, a concept, a process, whatever it is you're trying to teach them that's actually quite complex. So getting students to make things is one of the most motivating things you can do for them. They love being creative and they're very good at being using digital tools. I mean, they're, they're not faced by having to create pictures or animations. I mean, a lot of them are very good at that sort of thing anyway. But having to do this in service of a particular ac academic idea and its representation is very good individual self-regulated learning for them. So now we come to this interesting question. Is this a parsimonious account of the teaching learning process? So I thought I'd better give some attention to the word parsimonious because it's not a very common word. And for me, the principle of parsimony has an English history which goes back to the 14th century because there was a man who was a, he was a, a monk of some kind, and he was also a philosopher and like many such people, he kind of experimented with science as well. And he had this principle that an explanation of something in the world should be as simple as possible. Entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. So if you're trying to describe something in the world, like the water sample, for example, you should have the minimum number of entities to be used to explain them. And if you want to decide between two different explanations of something in the world, choose the simplest one. That was, that was his principle. And he had this nice, very straightforward Latin, um, which of course he wrote in the original Latin, so NTR non sunt multiplicanda praetena sentitatum, you can see the exact match with the English. That's where English comes from, of course. So, my question about the conversational framework is, is this the most parsimonious account we could have of the teaching learning process? I don't think you could get much simpler because then you take away too much of the complexity of the teaching learning process. It's simple enough already. Um, the teacher, the learner, and the peer are all necessary actors in this process. You can't do without them. The two levels of knowledge, and action or ideas, experience, concepts and practice, you've got to release up those two levels. You've got to know stuff about the world and you've got to be able to use that to act on the world. You've got to be able to use your actions on the world to develop your knowledge, you can't do without that. So those two. The six types of learning could be reduced to five because learning through collaboration is, a, is actually a combination of discussion and practice and production. So we could reduce it to five, but learning through collaboration is so important, it's really valuable to have that just as an expression of one of the learning types. So you, you could combine some of the others into particular forms of learning, but keep it down to six, because if you move to seven or eight, and people will often say to me, why can't we have problem solving in there? Well, problem solving is just another form of learning through practice. So keep it simple as far as you can. Because if you've got 10 types of learning, people will forget them all. And it makes it too complex to, to think. Keep it to six. And my defense is that Bloom was allowed six times of learning outcome. 
So I think we will stick with six. We won't increase it beyond that. Okay, so it's reasonably parsimonious, I think, at that level. Now, what about learning design? How simple can we keep that? Well, at least we've got to have people and types of learning and the logistics of actually what you do and who does what to do and the pedagogies. We've got to have those in there. And the people are the teacher, the learner, their peers, and their concepts all being represented as well. He's got to have all those. The learning types, we've got the six learning types. Logistics, well, duration is crucial because you've only got so much time you can spend in a course. Blended or online, we've got all of those different opportunities now, or even just face-to-face -face on its own. Group sizes, are you, as the learner, working as an individual, or in a small group, or in a whole class? The teacher can be present or not. So you can be setting up things for your students to do as homework or as preparation for a class session. The teacher is not present. We're just designing for them what they should be doing. Are they using the internet or not? Is it synchronous or asynchronous? If everyone's in the class, it's synchronous. If they're in an online discussion group, it's probably asynchronous. And what about digital resources? Because that's really where the content lies. So we've got to have at least that in there. And then the pedagogy, it all begins with the learning outcomes. What are you really trying to help your students be able to do? And for that, they've got to work through all these different learning types of thinking and practicing and testing and arguing and experimenting and so on. And you've got to give them some sort of guidance as to how they're meant to do that learning through discussion. You can't just say, go off and discuss. You've got to give them some guidance as to the focus of their discussion, what they've got to bring back from it, and so on. And all of this is enabling those cycles of learning. Well, the cycles of learning are kind of embedded in some of the other things, but at least that's, that's essentially that's part of what the pedagogy is. So the teacher has to design both learning types and logistics in order to develop pedagogy. The pedagogy describes essentially what students will do to learn, and then all of those actions they do, especially in a digital space, leave traces of data for the learning analytics. And now we're beginning to get towards how we start embedding learning analytics in all this. Right. So the learning designer was set up as a free, open, online design tool to help teachers with this whole new business of planning blended learning. Because we're Everyone's very familiar with conventional methods. But with all these digital methods, they get much more complex. And there wasn't much help on what of the teachers. There were virtual learning environments, but they didn't help you with design. So that's why we created the learning designer, much in the same way as Nancy and her colleagues created the learning studio, learning design studio. And I'm really looking forward to that workshop they have on that. So this is trying to do something similar, but at the level of just the session, not getting into to course level. It's just about the, the pedagogy. And this is meant to support the teachers to design a sequence of blended and online teaching and learning activities, and then analyze their pedagogy design, and then evaluate and reflect on how to optimize it. So it looks like this. If we go to, you'll have all these slides available to you, by the way. And it, People are taking pictures of it. You will have the slides. <laughs> so honestly, that will um, make it much easier for you. Um, so you can either use what other teachers have contributed to this website, their learning designs, and adapt those to what you want. Or you can create your own. And then you do the analyze and review. And if you like what you've done, you share it, and then ultimately publish it. The browser screen has Lots and lots of things already contributed. I'm going to use the one on sustainable development, and I'm going to inspect that and see if it's something that I would like to use. So you can see from the top of the screen, if only I could make this film. Not a very good shooter. This is the basic information. It's going to last, my session's going to last an hour. I've got 25 students. There's some description underneath this. Um, these are the learning outcomes, so this is where I can put in the verbs so, and rooms taxonomy um, and the description of the overall aims. And this one is, is classroom based. 
So I might want to develop one online, but I'll look at this classroom-based one. So we've got three stages. There's um, uh, yeah, so it's thinking about the use of plastics, improving our use of plastics, and then after the class, what do they do about that? And they have to produce something for the teacher. So if I click on edit, then I've turned this into my own copy of the serving design, so I can now change everything on the screen. So I might want to change it fairly minimally, or I might want to add all sorts of things in. And one of the things I could, oops. Sorry. Oh dear, I'm going the wrong way. That's it. So you can see there's a variety of different icons here. This one, the first one represents the duration of this activity is 15 minutes. This one is five and this one is five. And then how many students are grouped together? This is the whole class of 25. This is also, and that's a, an individual activity and then they come back to the class. Whereas here they're collaborating in pairs and then later in threes and so on. And is the teacher present? There's a tick by the teacher, so yes, for all these. And we're not using the internet. And there's a tick on the calendar because it's synchronous and there's uh, some resources that are attached to this. So those are all those features of the description of the logistics of this and what's actually going on. And the pedagogy is in your selection of the type of learning. So this is learning through acquisition, through reading, watching, or listening, then discussion, then inquiry, then I think we've got collaborate here as well. So you don't necessarily use all of them. It depends on, I think we've got production over here in, in the end. Um, and you decide what characteristics your pedagogy is going to have and what things are going to add to it. Okay, so if we look at this in a bit more detail here, it's really, it's a way of um, emphasizing and articulating what your expression of how students are going to learn this, this topic. Then if we go to the uh, if we go to the analysis screen, all that information you put in is now analyzable and it reflects it back to you in the form of what kind of learning experience you've created for the students. So we can see from the pie chart here that we've got quite a lot of learning through acquisition. Uh, the yellow is collaboration, we've got no production, no practice. Well, that's fine, you know, that's what I thought of, and maybe that's okay, but I might decide that actually I would like a bit of practice in there, so I might go back and change it. But it, there's no rules. You could do exactly what you think is appropriate. And of course, it's all face-to-face, -face. there's a classroom, and the teacher's always present, and it's always synchronous. Um, it's a little bit of individual work, a bit more group work, and mostly whole class work. So it's just an opportunity here for me to reflect on what I think that pedagogy looks like and if it's good enough. Now, if I want to optimize digital methods, then I'm going to include some digital tools. And here we can do this in a number of places on this Google Doc where students are thinking about their ideas about re replacing plastics. They can collect their ideas together. Um, they can also use this Miro board. Um, here, I think they're in, in groups to discuss their ideas and they're sharing those on the Miro board. And then there's a group forum on, on Moodle, which is where they're deciding how they're going to make it better, that sort of thing. Okay, so those digital tools, um, there's three for this particular design, but what they do is they create digital traces. Now, if the students are working in Moodle anyway, there will be Moodle um, traces of what they're doing. But on these particular resources as well, there'll be text. Um, depending on what it is, I mean, with something like a mirror board, you've also got structures and relations. And it's possible that you could have some kind of analysis of that as feedback to students or as feedback to the teacher on how well the students are doing. It. But at least you've got text. So we can know that we could analyze some of that. So this is a way of enabling teachers to share ideas and work together 
Um, I'm going to concentrate most on the evaluating the learning design because I think for learning analytics, that's the bit we're particularly interested in. And there's several ways of doing that. You can do it through your students. So each of these um, learning sections has a bit at the end called notes. So when you've run your session with the students, maybe at the end of the term or maybe at the end of the week, you could give them access to your design and invite them to write their own commentary on how well that particular part of the design worked. And it's much more precise than doing something like using a little scale in a survey, where students say, I'm not particularly interested in this, or I wasn't very interested in that or something, because these are very precise comments. So here we've got, if we just expand this a bit, the students here saying, love the investigative activity, but spent more, much more than 10 minutes on it. And then only one person turned up to collaborate, but it was okay. Now that's useful feedback to the teacher. You know that there's something you could think about, something to do. For this one, the discuss part was too hurried, trying to keep the time. We didn't get to discuss some of the issues that came up in the final session. We could have shared knowledge on Menti. I'm, I'm not depending on the grammar here. Uh, we could have shared non answers on Menti like we did before. So we're making suggestions about the kind of digital tools that we might use. So this is a very good way of engaging the students with really thinking through the quality of your teaching and how they can learn better from you. So um, then we come to thinking about if we want to generate learning analytics, what we want to, to know is what makes a good learning design. And one of the things, I mean, there's, this is a rubric that we use well, when teachers submit learning designs to the learning designer, we want to say, that's a good one, we'll make that available to other teachers. We go through this rubric to say, does it satisfy all these different criteria? So the one that I'm going to spend most time on is, is meaningful feedback to students, but all of those are important. Obviously, you've got to have clear learning outcomes, you've got to have appropriate use of important pedagogic choices and so on. But what we notice with the world of learning analytics at the moment is that they're very dependent on, or they seem to be most of the time, dependent on identifying which resources were used, how much use they got, and things like the number of posts or something like that. So really, this only relates to this particular criterion. And then one of the great difficulties with using this kind of data is that you don't know from that account why the students did what they did. So you might have two or three videos which are used a lot, and then a, a video which is not used at all. Now that tells you nothing about the quality of that video. It might tell you about the quality of the previous videos that students have got fed up with looking at rubbish videos and might be a little bit anymore. So you have to be very careful what kind of message you get from that purely numerical analysis of the data that platforms happen to collect. This is the data that platforms happen to collect. And what we want is all these other things, which the platforms don't collect at all for us. So we've got to think quite hard about that. So just let's go through. The final part of this is thinking through the rubric for this self-peer expert review process is to think about all these different aspects of design. Now, what could learning analytics do to give us an automated analysis from our design. Well, we could look at how clear it is by looking at, at analyzing the outcomes against Bloom's keywords. So how well are those outcome statements written against Bloom's taxonomy? Now that's something which large language models ought to be able to do reasonably well. So we could get some help there. Appropriate pedagogic choices I categorize as too hard. Um, who knows what the appropriate pedagogic choices are? You find out the teacher doesn't know. You don't find out until you try and develop with the students. And some things work with some students and not with others. So that's really too hard. But when we're we're looking at the quality of a learning design, we have to take that kind of thing account, into account by thinking about um, very often things like whether the guidance to students is sufficient, whether they've been given appropriate time and that sort of thing. But again, whether that guidance is sufficient for the students is a pretty hard judgment to make. I'm not sure 
how easy it would be for any analytics to do that. Use of additional resources, yes, there are things they can do there because you can certainly, you've got the use of it, which we know about very well, but you could also check how they're used. You could advise on alternative um, digital tools to use because um, the large language models should have some information about what kinds of tools are good for doing this kind of um, action, so that's feasible. The balance of learning types, I don't think, um, we can't say anything about what makes a good balance because it's so dependent on the particular context. So we put no rules into the learning design tool itself, um, and I don't think you could add much to what the pie chart is telling us which is just really, it's a thinking tool for the teacher to think about, does that look right, really, given my experience? And you build that experience up over time. So I'm, I'm not sure we could do much with that. Appropriate time allocation is very hard. Humans can't do it. I mean, we all, all get that wrong. The first time you create a learning design, one of the things that happens most often in the workshops we run is that teachers are planning a one hour session and then they develop two hours worth of stuff for students to do because you just want them to do more and more things and you end up, you find you've created two hours of stuff. So it's very hard for us to work out what's the appropriate amount. And I'm not sure what we expect when we will the study for us. Meaningful feedback, well, advice and analysis could be done on the basis of text, I think. And I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. And I think we might do something on constructive alignment because we've got all the information there. We've got the words in the learning outcomes. We've got the words in the description of um, what students have to do, the guidance to students. And we've got the production activities, which are also analyzable in terms of the words that they, they record. So it's possible that we could do some something to help without analyzing constructive alignment. Okay, so just looking at forms of feedback then, this is, um, I think, my penultimate slide. Self-assessment against all these different forms of feedback assessment, self-assessment, peer review, teacher feedback, digital tools or environments, and automated feedback. So I'm taking those as the main ones that we might want to continue to use. For self-assessment, insofar as students are using text, then you could do an AI-type comparison of the text against the model answer. So in the same way as a student can do that comparison, an AI tool could, and it might be able to offer a bit of extra advice if it builds up and learns something about that process. With peer review, again, it could offer a bit of extra feedback from what peers can offer. So peer review is a very valuable pedagogy because you learn so much from doing a review of someone else's work that you've just been trying to do yourself. And it may be a rubbish piece of work or it may be brilliant. Either way, you will learn something from that process. They may or may not give you useful feedback. And that's where it might be good to have chat GPT offering a bit extra. And then similarly with teacher feedback, teachers will, will give very good feedback. Chat GPT ought to be able to offer something a bit better in a, um, a formative sentence. So it makes the students think about this a bit more before submitting to the teacher, I might even be able to add something in, in relation to the rubric that the teacher might have missed, it's feasible. Digital tools, um, well, digital tools are great at giving intrinsic feedback anyway, because as I was explaining with the energy example, the student finds out how well they've done it because they know that they haven't achieved the goal. So they know how to um, adapt their actions on that. But the AI could perhaps offer some additional interpretation. So it could help the student with interpreting their artwork in terms of which parameters they might like to look at next, something like that. Which leaves us then with automated feedback, which is really the whole point of the whole thing, really, is to look at how AI could analyze student outputs against the set goal. They've got information from the text that students have written. They could maybe um, organize advice on gaps between what the student has written and what the goal is asking for. I think it's very unlikely they could help much with misconceptions. And this is where you need educational research to find out how students misunderstand basic concepts. And that's not something that AI easily discerns because 
AI looks at the relationship between what the student's written and what the, um, the, 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 the proper answer is and points out the gaps. But understanding the nature of their misconception, um, for example, um, if you remember your basic physics in students' third law of motion, it's all about every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Right? Now, that's a terrible way of describing it because students tend to think this is all about equilibrium and the forces are balancing each other, the forces are balancing each other. And of course, it's not the forces, it's the combination of the mass and the acceleration. And you can have a very small object exerting a very small object exerting a, a tiny amount of force and therefore having a very large acceleration towards a very large object which has has almost no acceleration at all in relation to the small object and that's what's so hard for students to understand and being able to explain that and i have tested chat gbt on this and it's hopeless so being able to explain that means being able to understand the nature of the student's misconception which is a good piece of thinking very often but just completely wrong. So for an automated tool to be able to get that explained, I think is tricky, but I think it could do some things here. So to summarize, a parsimonious approach, parsimonious approach to design and learning languages, could we do it? Well, I think we can define a parsimonious approach to learning design in terms of the six learning types and various pedagogical features. And I think for a learning design for a particular session, with particular learning outcomes, I think we can we can keep that as compact as the learning designer does. It doesn't need to go much beyond that. So the learning design supports the development of good learning design based on the conversational framework and the log logistics and the pedagogical features. So we can crunch that down to something. So AI could develop, I think, support for a parsimonious approach but as design generated. So you generate your learning analytics from the design that you've created. So you're not just focusing on how much resource people have used and how many times they watch the videos. You're doing something deeper than that. You're looking at what students are actually doing and trying to, to generate the analytics from that. And then it's not just the usual learning analytics, it's learning process analytics. It's looking at the teaching learning process. And that's where we want to get the analytics from to, to find out how best to do it. Okay, so finally, a bit of promotion of our new book, Online Learning Futures, which I've written, I've written with a, um, a colleague of mine at UCL. Um, there's not much about learning analytics, but there is a lot about learning design in it, so at least there's some. So thank you very much. I very much welcome your challenges, uh, questions. Have questions here? Okay, thank you, Dana, for these thought provoking um, presentations. Um, actually, uh, I use one of the uh, conversation framework slides uh, in my teacher training workshop. Yes, I, I find it uh, very uh, easy to understand for the teacher. Uh, framework and uh, my question is also about the learning design part uh, because uh, uh, for example in China many teacher uh, uh, training um, uh, community culture is uh, is very uh, solid they have uh, researched the lesson um, very carefully rigorously um, but uh, you know there is some uh, transformation from more knowledge oriented curriculum to more competence based or, uh, curriculum and uh, while I, I find the most challenging work is that the teachers need to um, um, design their learning experience in a more coherent way uh, uh, as you said, uh, this is more like um, a session based, focus on yeah. uh, single sessions. Yeah. But when the teachers need to think about uh, uh, a series of sessions to deliver um, um, a big concept in a specific curriculum, there might be a change. But uh, as we know, that in uh, instructional uh, design theories, there are many types of models like from base learning, prior learning, and so on. So this kind of is what kind of um, higher level structure about uh, learning design. So 
can this kind of uh, level be um, modeled to yeah. guide the teachers yes. to lessen the lack? Thank you. Yes, I, I think it can. That's an important question. Um, and one of the areas of the browser in the tool is types of pedagogy. So it's got forum based learning and query based learning drivers. In there. It's got all sorts of pedagogy based designs under that sort of heading. So that if you're particularly interested in problem based learning, for example, you could go look at all those particular designs. And there are also some which are um, subject oriented, but we tend not to emphasize those because this is really about emphasizing the pedagogy. And we want to to promote that idea that an English literature teacher can borrow something from a chemistry teacher and vice versa. It's the pedagogy that counts. And the number of content words in a learning design are quite few, and you can replace them with your own content. Most of the pedagogy stays the same. But then to address your point about um, getting beyond session level to the next level up of how you plan across the whole semester or whatever, um, that's the next level, and that's a block structure. So that's the version which is being developed now. And then the problem is that you've got to look at the relationship between learning outcomes at, at term level and individual level. And there are complex relations. So that's one of the reasons why this has taken a while to, to work, because sometimes in the course you have a kind of um, acquisition, no, it's a, an accumulation of ideas, and they're all the same sorts of things. So it might be, say, in an art history course, you've got 10 different genres you've got to know about, and that's just, they could be in any order, almost. But if you're trying to understand the nature of composition, you might begin with quite simple ones and work up to like com quite complex ones. So the learning outcome relationships there are purely additive in the first one, and the second one, they're hierarchical, they're building up. So we've got these interesting internal um, relationships between the learning outcomes for a whole course and the learning outcomes of each individual um, uh, session. But yes, that, but that's what's building up because we're starting at the ground up, if you like. So collect all those together and you've got a block. And collect all the blocks together and you've got a program. That, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because, because uh, when the teachers design, it's kind of like a top down uh, way. They yes, to that's what they get. Yes. yes. Big goal first, yeah. then to yeah. see how it can be divided into different uh, yeah. sub goals. Very true. Yeah. So, so, so I'm thinking maybe the, the structure is more important uh, when they first are thinking about uh, uh, how to achieve the uh, big goal of this curriculum. Absolutely. Yes, yes, and I think we might come to some of that in the learning design studio session. It might be a bit more about that. The yeah. next session, the workshop. The next session, the workshop. Yeah. Any more questions here? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Laurie Land. Um, uh, my question is um, I'm from a, a background of uh, science and technology, but currently I'm teaching in a school of design. So uh, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions or principles um, that teaching in uh, the interdisciplinary courses. Thank you so much. Oh, nothing like a tough question. <laughs> um, it, it's a very interesting issue because the relationship between science and design is, is quite a complex one. Um, and as I mentioned, one of my books is Teaching as a Design Science. And what I mean by that is that it's much more like engineering than it is like physics. Because in both the cases of both teaching and in engineering, you're trying to make something happen differently in the world. What you're doing in physics or in psychology is you're trying to understand and represent what's happening in the world to then use it in your, in your practice. So there's, again, there's a complex internal relationship between knowledge and understanding in the science and knowledge and understanding in design science or in design context. So for interdisciplinary work, I think it does help if the interlocutors, all the people working together on this, have some sense of that difference. You know, this is science and science doesn't have to be immediately useful. We may not know why it's useful yet. Could take centuries before this becomes useful. 
Whereas design works in the here and now and is changing something in the world. And it may use science, and it helps very often if it does use science, but not necessarily. It might just be iterative design, test, redesign, design, test, redesign. So you've got an interesting problem of being, are you one person in a, in an, in a science department? Um, technology department? If it's technology, that's another design science, so you're okay. Uh, actually, uh, in our uh, uh, school of design, we have uh, a very... Uh, oh, in the school of design, you'll have yeah, lots of yeah, people, yes. Yeah. We have a very uh, diverse background. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yes, design does attract people with diverse backgrounds, yes. yes. But I thought you said you were working in a science context. Uh, my background is in science and technology. Oh, I see, yeah. okay. Actually, I have a PhD in mathematics. Oh, that's useful. So that, that's very good. That covers everything. You know, it's fundamental. I did a combined undergraduate degree in mathematics and philosophy, and those were exactly the right things to be doing, given the career I turned out to have, because mathematics, you can talk to anybody in science, engineering, technology. In philosophy, you can talk to anybody on humanities and social sciences. So for, for being in a central educational technology center, you could talk to everybody across the entire campus about what was good for their subject. Mm -hmm. So you're in a very similar position for that because you're you in a design science and you can get people thinking the right way. Yeah. That's very good. I don't think I answered your question. Because <laughs> there's another question. Uh, one last question. I have a question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Diana. Uh, sorry, Professor Diana, sorry. Uh, in your speech, really, it's very uh, presentation. I was wondering, you said that AI could support a parsimonious approach for uh, learner per a learning precise analytics. And you mentioned specifically, uh, AI can generate feedback for the for learning. So is there anything else that AI can do to support learning analytics? Probably. Um, um, so probably quite a lot of things. <laughs> but we're at the beginning of thinking about this, really. Mm -hmm. um, learning analytics has risen as a practice over a long time. I mean, it seems to have been around for a very long time, but it hasn't got very far mm -hmm. because it's relying on the analytic data that happens to be provided by all these platforms. Mm -hmm. So my question is, let's think about what we need as teachers and learners mm -hmm. and go to the platforms and the techie people with those demands. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm sure there's an awful lot more it could do, but we're still at the fairly early stages. Mm -hmm. Can you can you give me a few examples, maybe? No, because I don't know what they're going to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's. I'm sorry, I can't answer your question very well beyond what I've already said. I think. Okay. I mean, I went through the different kinds of feedback mm -hmm. that we can have mm -hmm. and sought for each one of those. What could AI possibly do? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that it can do an awful lot more than what I've suggested. Colleagues with more technical background may be able to say, actually, we could do a lot on analyzing pedagogy or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But you know, we, but that's what we've got to think about. Okay, to you. think about it from the point of view of the learner and the teacher, not about what the platform happens to generate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions. Um, but, uh, because of the time, uh, we have to end this session here. But uh, later on, we will have a panel with Professor Lorna and Professor Nancy Law and also Professor Shaolin Good to be uh, discussing these topics. That will be 445 in uh, room 203, is um, uh, one floor above 203. Okay, so please come back and have a discussion at that time. And for now, let's thank our professor at the end.